Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Worship with Ramon Avenue Christian Church. I'm Dr. Matt, as always, and you are welcome to this time of worship, wonder, and prayer. Uh, we are continuing this series on uh, prayer in the Bible. In fact, today we're coming to the prayer that we're going to sing in just a couple minutes, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, this is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And so we're going to dig into that a bit. Uh, but a few words about today's service. We will be taking communion later, so if you have something to eat, something to drink, we will partake together later in the service. And uh, we also will be enjoying some special music today, um, a piece produced around Psalm 46. And uh, yeah, and then we'll be, as I mentioned, um, well, a couple of things. Next Sunday begins the season of Advent. And so through Advent, I'm going to be continuing this series on prayers in the Bible, and we'll be looking at um, prayers in the uh, story of Jesus' birth, uh, leading up to the birth of Jesus. So um, Advent is those these four weeks that we spend where we uh, await and anticipate the coming um, of Jesus' birth. Uh, this Sunday is actually kind of an unusual one. Uh, this is the Sunday after Thanksgiving, which usually is the first Sunday of Advent. But this year, we get an extra Sunday in here after Thanksgiving. And uh, in the church calendar, the Sunday before Advent is called Christ the King Sunday. This is uh, where we remember the reign of God uh, and the rule of God. And so we are, I'm going to be uh, reflecting on that in context of our sermon, and you'll notice the songs kind of will uh, come around that theme as well. So as we uh, move into the rest of our time of worship, I want to invite us um, to sing the Lord's Prayer. Now as you sing it, keep in mind we're going to be talking about it in just a little while, so let's sing. church, as we come to our time of prayer today, um, I have a number of things to keep in our, on our hearts and minds. Of course, the situation that continues to unfold in the Holy Land um, is of concern. And um, we've got some potential good news there um, on that score that uh, um, Israel and Hamas uh, agreed to a ceasefire that, that uh, began on Friday. And uh, hopefully is still holding as you view this. <laughs> it's supposed to go through at least Monday, uh, potentially longer. Um, but there's uh, there's uh, more aid getting in to the Gaza Strip than has happened the entire time uh, of this conflict. And also the um, uh, there have been some uh, exchanging of hostages, uh, hostages for prisoners. So uh, a number of people are getting out foreigners and, and other folks, women and children primarily at this point. Um, so we want to pray that this would be a good step um, toward a defusing situation if possible. Israel has made it clear though that as soon as the ceasefire is open, they are over, they were they will go back to 
um, attacking and and bombing and so on, um, possibly for another two months. So oh, keep that whole thing in your prayers and and really do. And I I want to say just a word about there's been a growing amount of anti-Semitism and um, also um, Islamophobia and hate crimes uh, against uh, both Jews and Muslims uh, in the United States and in Europe and uh, all around the world, actually. And um, I just want to say it is possible to criticize the Israeli government for its actions without being anti-Semitic, right? That, that, that is possible. In fact, there's a lot of American Jews in particular who are criticizing what the Israeli government is doing and the proportionality and so on. Um, and I would put myself in that camp, that you know, criticizing what the government is doing um, while still caring and feeling for the people. And, and the same on the other side, that you, could, you, can, uh, you can condemn Hamas without being anti-Palestinian, without being Islamophobic. Um, and in fact, going after people because they're Muslim is, is even a miss, is just a missing the mark anyway, because um, Palestinians are, are, yes, they're mostly Muslim, but there are also Palestinian Christians. Um, in fact, when, I, when my wife and I lived in Prague, I had students uh, that I worked with who were from, you know, I had a guy who was from Bethlehem, for example, who was a Palestinian Christian wanting to learn so he could go back and, and be a, a better pastor and possibly even teach at a, uh, there's a, a seminary, if I recall, in or a Bible college in Bethlehem, um, which is, by the way, in the West Bank. Um, that is part of the occupied territories. Um, so, yeah, there's, there are Palestinian Christians in there, too. So it's, it's, it's not as simple, as simple as some people um, want to think it is. Also, there are quite a bit, quite a few Arabs and, and Palestinians living in, in Israel, in the country of Israel as well. So, um, and you can imagine the conf conflicted feelings that many of them may be having around all of this too. At the same time, you can also um, condemn Hamas without being, like I said, without being anti-Palestinian. You could be pro-Palestinian and say Hamas is not the way to go, nor is from the river to the sea. And you may have heard this. I've seen this as a hashtag. I hear people saying this. Um, it's a dangerous phrase. I think a lot of people are using it without really knowing the context behind it. Um, but that is, a, that is a phrase. It refers to the Jordan River to the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, from the river to the sea. And what it indicates is the, this idea that, that the Palestinians should control all of that territory, which basically means the forced displacement or killing of the Jews living in that space now. So it's, it's a, the term has a genocidal overtone to it. Um, so we don't have to go from the river to the sea to support the Palestinian people. We don't have to support Hamas to support the Palestinian people. We can condemn Hamas. We can de condemn genocide on both sides because what's happening in Gaza right now is bad. Ten, well over 10,000 people killed. And they say they're going to keep going even longer. So... Again, pray for the peace and justice of the Holy Land. Uh, as long as we're on happy topics, um, on the 17th, so several days back, um, on November 17th, for the first time in recorded history, the global average temperature of the planet exceeded two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So what does that mean? Well, you take the whole, the entire globe, you average the temperature out for the entire planet. Before the Industrial Revolution, it was at a certain level, right? Then we started 
burning fossil fuels for the industrial revolution amount of carbon dioxide goes up temperatures start rising right got a lot faster more recently the average temperature of the entire globe now on that day on the 17th and presumably on more days to come was two degrees centigrade which is uh 3.6 degrees fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels first time in recorded history that the average temperature of the globe has gotten that much warmer 3.6 degrees fahrenheit two degrees celsius it's not much it doesn't sound like much but if you think about the amount of energy that that represents this two degrees centigrade for the entire planet it's an enormous amount of energy actually um and uh it's it's doing all kinds of things uh, in fact i heard on the radio uh, on yeah on the radio that um the government just put out i think it was the government put out a new um map for uh, temperature zones for like gardeners basically for like planting and like what kinds of plants will do well in what kinds of climates and so on and it was the first time they updated it i think in about 11 or 12 years and the zones have shifted north because of global warming and it's throwing uh, gardeners into a kind of a scramble as it's becoming a very highly googled item uh, looking for this map to see how it how the data is affecting what crops are going to make sense to grow, uh, how long the growing season is going to be. It's, it's affecting a lot of things like that. And of course, we've seen uh, other effects of it with heat waves and so on. But so we need to be continuing to pray for the health and the well being of our planet because this is our home. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's the one we got. So we're probably going to start seeing over the next few decades, we're probably going to be seeing, start to see uh, migrations away from some of the hotter places on the planet. Uh, we're going to see people migrate away from the equator, most likely, start to migrate toward the north and the south to escape some of the extremes of heat that we're going to be up against. And... Uh, you know, and it might do some weird things too, like plunge Europe into uh, a cold age. I don't know if you call it an ice age, but there's a, a current, a warm current that brings, that keeps Europe. Because if you look at Europe on a globe, it's, it's further north than the U.S., but it has kind of a te similar temperature range. Um, but that's because it has this nice ocean current that brings warm water up to kind of warm that area more than it than it would be normally. Um, but that current is is getting disrupted by the changes in temperature. And so if that collapses, um, the temperatures in Europe could drop rather suddenly and, and precipitously. So, again, we're going to be seeing effects of this. Just wanted to say, November 17th, we crossed that, that uh, threshold. Doesn't mean that we've broken the agreement, the barriers that they're trying to keep on with like the Paris Accords and, and so on, the Climate Accords, but we're on the way. So, um, yeah. And then, of course, there are people uh, among us who are recovering or who are ill, who we know people who have received diagnoses, people who are struggling, but also people who are recovering, who are doing well. And so we rejoice in that. And so as we come uh, to God, I'm going to share a prayer. Uh, this is from our, our hymnal. And if you have one, Chalice Hymnal, it's, um, it's number 710. 710. Um, Let the day come, Lord. This is a prayer by... Uh, Lucien Dies, I don't speak French, so I murdered that pronunciation, I'm sure. Um, but this was a 20th century uh, French Catholic liturgist. Uh, it's called Let the Day Come, Lord. And it seemed appropriate today on Christ the King Sunday. So let us pray together. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let the day come, Lord, when our world's misery 
will find your mercy. Let the day come when our poverty will find your riches. Let the day come when our path will find the way to your house. Let the day come when our tears will find your smile. Let the day come when our joy will find your heaven. Let the day come when your church will find the kingdom. May you be blessed, Father, for that day when our eyes will find your face. Throughout all the time of our lives, you have not ceased to come before us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our brother. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Amen. Something's coming. I can feel it. Something's always coming, I guess. Some kind of storm rolling in, always threatening. This looks like another big one. My dad always said, a man's gotta be ready for anything. You do the work, you hunker down, you take care of what's yours. A man don't run when the storm's coming. That's what he said. You be strong, you be the mountain, you don't move. <sighs> he was a mountain, all right. Then he was gone. Sometimes mountains fall. The storm hits. The waters come up fast. Mountains can crumble and slide right off into the sea. I've seen it happen. I'm no mountain. And I'm not standing out here on my own, Dad. I found something stronger. God is my refuge. I don't run away, but I do run to Him. He shows up every time. He helps when it gets bad. Maybe this storm will miss us. Maybe not. Let it come, whatever it is. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not even gonna try to handle it on my own. I've seen what God can do. He is the storm sometimes. He's all the strength I need. He's the real mountain. I won't move as long as I'm with him. So I'm sticking with him, Dad. He is God. The scripture for today is Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Pray like this, Our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us, and don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Luke 11, 2-4 Jesus told them, When you pray, say, Father, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who has wronged us, and don't lead us into temptation. So church, we come today to um, a prayer that is quite familiar with, uh, with us. If you've been following us for any time at all, we sing this every Sunday, basically, the Lord's Prayer, we call it, because it is the prayer that was taught to the disciples um, by their Lord, Jesus. And um, 
So I'm going to dig into it a bit today. And I know I've, I've preached an entire series on this. Um, in fact, now that I remember, recall, um, right at the very beginning of the pandemic, I'm pretty sure uh, when the pandemic hit, I was in the middle of a series on the Lord's Prayer. So, yeah, so some of our really earliest ones that we recorded and, and put online are in the midst of, of that series, if I remember right. So, so what do we say about the Lord's Prayer? Thinking about it as a prayer, though, right? Because you can pick it apart and, you know, like I did before, take, take it almost line by line and pull out of every line. But if you just step back and look at it as a prayer as a whole, um, what can it teach us? One thing is that this prayer, it, the way it's presented to us in the Gospels, and it's in Matthew and Luke, as we just heard, um, it's presented as a, a prayer that was taught specifically to the disciples. Um, they saw Jesus praying, and when he was finished, they said, teach us, to, teach us a prayer, like, teach us how to pray. And part of that may have been uh, coming from a place of curiosity. Part of it also may have been a kind of cultural thing, because uh, whenever there was a rabbi who taught, they would usually have a particular prayer that they would teach their disciples to use. Um, and so the disciples are, in essence, asking for that. It's like, how should we pray? Like, what kinds of things should we be praying about? And so Jesus taught him this prayer. And I don't think, ultimately, that what Jesus meant was, I want you to repeat this prayer verbatim every time you pray. Right? Um, to some extent, we've taken it a little bit that way in the church. And, and I, you know, and I, I mean, we're as guilty of it as anyone, right? I just said we sing it every Sunday. But then we also follow it up with a prayer time where we bring our more specific concerns of the day, of the week, of the month, and of the world. So what Jesus was doing here was kind of saying, this is a, an idea of how you could pray. And so you could take this as like a model prayer, I think is maybe a good way to put it. And, and now we do have two different versions of it in Matthew and Luke, and they are a bit different. Um, for the most part, Luke's is shorter. <laughs> and then if you pick Luke's and you just add in some bits, you get Matthew is mo pretty much what happens. Um, it, it could be, you know, Jesus taught it to him on a couple different occasions. They used it at different times, and, you know, whatever. Um, might also be that Luke just was taking short, you know, shorter notes than Matthew's, you know, Matthew was. Um, we don't know. But they basically follow the same structure, really, anyway. So I'm going to start from Luke's version, but then I'll reference Matthew's because it's basically just an expansion of, of what we have in Luke. The one thing you will notice, and I, I'm going to come to this at the end, but the, the one thing you notice in the scripture was that it ends before we, us Protestants, end the prayer, right? Catholics stop where the prayer stops in the New Testament. Um, we continue on with this, for the kingdom and the power and glory are yours forever, you know, amen. Um, that is qu quite likely, uh, it is. I mean, it's, it's very, very likely uh, kind of a liturgical ending that was added to the prayer at some point along the way, because it's, it only shows up in some pretty late New Testament manuscripts, the earlier ones, all the reliable ones, like early ones, have it the way we have it here. So doesn't mean it's not worth praying. It's just, yeah, it is what it is. But uh, so it starts off, Jesus, Jesus said, pray like this, right? In Matthew's pray like this, Luke, when you pray, say this, you know, something like this. And it, so it begins, Father, uphold the holiness of your name. Now, we're, we're used to hearing that, hallowed be thy name. Right, and we did just have All Hallows Eve not that long ago, right? Halloween, Hallow Eve. It's the Eve before All Hallows, All Saints Day, because Hallow to Hallow something is to make it holy, is to set it apart for a purpose. And so, what this first um, this first line is saying basically is, God. 
make your name, may your name be holy. May your name be special and separate and set apart. Uphold the holiness of your name. Then we get to this line, and this is where I really kind of want to land because um, it, it's Christ the King Sunday, so why not? Bring in your kingdom. And we, we say, thy kingdom come, or your kingdom come. Bring in your kingdom. It's kind of all the same idea. The idea is we are looking ahead to something. Um, and I should say at this point that um, this isn't a particularly Christian prayer that Jesus teaches them. I mean, he doesn't teach them a prayer in the name of Jesus or anything. Um, what he teaches them here is actually a very Jewish prayer. And uh, the, the Old Testament doesn't use the, the, the idea of kingdom, God's kingdom, so much. But it does talk about God's reign reign, uh, the day of the Lord, right? Uh, and there is this expectation, that the growing expectation through the, through the uh, Hebrew scriptures that at some point God is going to kind of culminate or bring about a renewed, a, a rejuvenated, a new sense in which God is sovereign over, um, over the universe. And so, thy kingdom come, bring in your kingdom, is drawing on that rich history. So, you know, this goes all through the scriptures, all through the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, you get it all over the place, but one place we could see it is, say, in the, um, the covenant with David, right? God says, you are going to be, there will always be a Davidic king on the throne. If they sin, I'm going to punish them, but I won't dethrone them like I did Saul. And then there's this line of succession of kings throughout their history. Um, but then the Babylonians destroyed Judah and carried them off to exile, and there was no king. But there was still this sense, there was this memory of this promise of a king, that there would always be a king. And what the growing realization was basically the kings we've had have not been perfect and they're not been eternal, so God must have something else in mind. And this is kind of what, this is what basically led to the idea of the Messiah. The Mashiach, which means anointed one, the Messiah, the anointed one, is that one who is coming. And... Uh, and even Jews today will talk about the Messianic age to come. Um, and so bring in your kingdom has all this, this kind of laden uh, hints of, of, of all that stuff from the Old Testament, all those expectations, all those longings for God to really come in and, and take control and uh, make history um, the way it should be. Now, Matthew adds on the, the bit here, which I, I love. So that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. <clears throat> so he says, so that. Now, this is nice because bring your kingdom, right? What is your kingdom, God? Right? It doesn't really talk about God's kingdom in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. Um, we get a lot of kingdom in the God language in the Gospels, so you can go look at the various parables that Jesus tells, and there's there's a lot there about the kingdom of God, and maybe that'll be a, you know maybe that'll be a good thing to talk about next year. Who knows? Um, but there's not much about kingdom specifically about you know what is this kingdom? All right, well go look at Jesus' parables, but in the meantime, Matthew gives us this: the kingdom comes so that God's will, God's desires, God's wants, what God wants to have happen, will happen here on earth as it is in heaven. So the idea is that, you know, in heaven, God, whatever heaven, however you conceive of heaven, is a place where God reigns, where God rules, where God is in control. Let earth be like that. 
And in fact, at the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, we see that, right? We see the, the new Jerusalem, the heavens coming down to earth, right? And in, in essence, it isn't so much that we go to heaven, it's that heaven comes to us. Heaven comes to earth. And we get a new heaven and a new earth. So this idea of bringing God's kingdom near. Right? And, th and that's what Jesus, throughout his ministry, Jesus said, that's, that's how he started the whole thing off. The kingdom of God is coming. It's, it's right here. Right? Repent and believe the good news. Now, a piece of this, too, then, is getting what we need. And so we ask for what we need. What do we need? We want God's kingdom. We also need <laughs> our bread. Right and and in 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 Hebrew the word the word for bread lechem uh, also means food more generally so it, it probably has that sense here too even though this is Greek um, right that bread right? give us today our daily bread give us the bread we need for today right each day give us the bread we need it's almost an echo back to the to the wilderness experience of Israel really um, where they relied on the manna this mana, this what kind of weird stuff that they, you know, they could get and they could make bread from it and so on. They had to collect it every day, except for the Sabbath. Right? On Fridays, they get double. And then they'd be good through the Sabbath, and then on Sunday, they start collecting it again. Give us today our bread for today. Give us the bread we need for today. Right? And God had them collect just enough for the day. They collected too much, it went bad. They tried to save it overnight, it went bad. But they always had enough. And there was enough the next day. Right? Um, now, just as we need bread every day, we need forgiveness every day. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who has wronged us. Right. Forgive us for the way we have wronged you, God, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. I don't know what there is to say about that. We all need forgiveness. Um, you know, I, I shared last week a bit about my struggles with certain parts of the church, and uh, I felt convicted about that. And I, and I feel like that's something I need to, you know, work on getting forgiveness for and repenting of. It doesn't mean that I'm just going to, you know, yay, we're all one. No, it doesn't mean that I trust people in the evangelical church. It doesn't mean that I like what they're doing, but... I don't wish them ill. I might have points, but I don't. And I want them to find Christ's blessings. I want them to come to God. And I hope they do. But we need forgiveness. And then the prayer wraps up with this, this uh, note of temptation. And it's, it, it's, it's strangely worded because it says, don't lead us into temptation. We're telling God not to lead us into temptation. Boy, I would hope God wouldn't lead us into temptation. Uh, the, the, temp, the temptation here, it has kind of the sense of being tested, right? Don't test us beyond what we can handle, right? Don't, don't try us too much. And then, and then uh, Matthew again adds, exp expands it a little bit and says, rescue us from the evil one, or rescue us from evil. It, it can be kind of translated either way. So there is evil in this world, God. It, it, keep, it, keep us from it. Rescue us from it. Because it permeates everything around us. It permeates our institutions. It permeates our political systems, our economic systems. Sin permeates the church. Sin permeates society. Keep it far from us. Keep the evil uh, from us. Don't let us fall into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. 
And then you end with that, you know, that glorious part that was added later. But it is glorious. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen, meaning may it be so. And again, it, it brings us back to the kingdom once again. The, you know, yours is the kingdom. It is your kingdom rule. You are the one who rules and reigns. You're the one who has power. And so we're asking for that to come into our reality. And that's really at base what this prayer is about. All the other things about forgiveness, about bread, about getting what we need for the day, and about forgiveness, um, all of those things are really all in service of or a peace with the coming of God's rule, the coming of God's way of being, of God's justice, God's righteousness, right? So let us pray. God, our parent, our nurturer, our caregiver, our father, our mother, let your name be held up as holy. Let your name be revered and seen for what it is. Bring your kingdom close. Bring your reign, your rule, your justice, your righteousness, your love, your power close. So that what happens here on earth will be what you want it to be the same way it is where you are. But you're here and there at the same time. So. Give us what we need each day. Help us to be fed and clothed and have shelter. Help us to have the basic necessities so that we can get through the day. And forgive us for all the ways that we wrong you, the ways that we wrong our siblings in Christ, our siblings, God's children. And God, help us to forgive them the way we've been forgiven. And don't lead us to be tempted beyond what we can handle, but deliver us from the evil of this age. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, as we prepare ourselves to come to Christ's table, um, invite us to sing together, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Hmm, almost like I planned that. So, let's sing, and I'll see you at Christ's table. Welcome to Christ's table. At this table, we see the chesed of God, that committed love in tangible form. The lengths and depths that God would go to, to reach us, to redeem us. On that night so long ago, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. 
And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. And then he took a cup, and again he gave thanks, Baruch Adonai, Haolam, Borei Puri Hagaf, and blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, the creator, the fruit of the vine. He gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And I won't drink from the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in God's kingdom. The body of Christ broken for us. The blood of Christ shed for us. Thanks be to God for the gifts of God, for the people of God. of invitation today is lead on O king eternal and so again coming with continuing with this theme of of uh, kingship and uh, christ the king sunday we uh, commit ourselves and recommit ourselves to following the one who rules over all the one who who has all power the one who rules with love and justice and mercy. So let's sing.
And now as we go into a world that could use some blessing, may God be above us to watch over us. May God be beneath us to lift us up. May God be ahead of us to lead us. May God be behind us to push us. May God be beside us to walk with us. May God be within us to love us forever. Amen.